Hello, hello everyone. Hi. Um, we clearly had some issues with the sound. Um, we apologize for that. Um, of course, we practice and it went perfectly fine. <laughs> and of course, it didn't work at the time. Uh, but I'm sure you're all used to these um, little glitches uh, in our life online. Um, so I'm just um, here to welcome everybody, uh, the speakers and the, and the audience. Uh, my name is Valentina Cardo and I'm Associate Professor of Politics and Identity at the Winchester School of Art. And uh, I'm absolutely privileged to be introducing this event in celebration of uh, LGBT plus History Month. Um, this is the first of a series of exciting events that the um, th that's organized through a collaboration between the Winchester School of Art and at the University of Southampton and the John Hansen Gallery. Um, and um, I have the pleasure really to introduce tonight's speakers. Um, so our first speaker in no order really uh, is Sarah Wood. Um, uh, she is an artist and filmmaker and curator. Um, and her re recent work includes um, a number of, uh, of installations and pieces. Um, uh, uh, one in uh, 2018 um, for the Wistable Biennale um, called Memory of the Future. Uh, one in 2019 uh, for Margaret Tate 100 and commissioned by Lux Scot Scotland, Lux Scot Scotland and the Bravest, called The Bravest Boat. Uh, a piece in 2020 uh, for Kettle's Yard uh, Gallery in Cambridge called Here is Elsewhere. And um, Sarah, Sarah's um, recent books include um, uh, Civilization and Its Malcontents, uh, published in 2017, a rereading of Freud for the 21st century, and The Enigmatic, Mes um, Enigmatic Message, um, published in 2018, which is a response to findings in the Stan Stanley Kubrick um, archive. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for being here. Uh, our second speaker tonight is Philip, Philip Hall, um, who's uh, an author and professional and professorial fe fellow, prof professional professorial <laughs> fellow, sorry, <laughs> in English at the University of Southampton. These are the glitches that I was talking about with sound. Uh, they come out in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so Philip's, Philip's book books include biographies of Stephen Tennant and Noel Coward, uh, the historical studies. Uh, Wild's Last Stand, Spike Island, and England's uh, Lost Eden. His book, uh, Le Leviathan or the Whale, won the 20, um, 2009 BBC Samuel Johnson Prize for, for, for nonfiction. Um, he, um, there is his um, 2013 book, The Scene Side, 2017 book, Rising Tide, Falling Star, and his forthcoming book, Plug. Um, Robert and the Well, which will be published. Um, Albert, Albert and the Well. <laughs> <laughs> I do apologize. Albert and the Well, which actually makes sense rather than Robert and the Well, which will be published by Force Estate in, in March 2021. And chairing tonight's event, I'm going to disappear in a minute. Chairing tonight's event is the, at the director of the John Hansard Gallery, uh, Woodrow um, Canoan. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. I'm going to go away now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Valentina. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. It's uh, amazing to see you in the background, and it's a real privilege to be here with uh, Philip and Sarah. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, extreme apologies for the technical glitch we had earlier. Uh, perhaps um, in the background, we might be able to share a link to the, the full quality um, video link of It's a Sin. Um, and thank you very much to the Pet Shop Boys and Parlophone Records for allowing us to play that uh, despite the audio uh, uh, quality. Um, so a warm welcome uh, to everyone from John Hansard Gallery that's part of the University of Southampton. Um, and warm welcome to Sarah Wood and Philip Hoare. Um, this talk tonight is part of John Hansard Gallery's online programme and is supported by the Barker Mill Foundation. And the event and um, the events on subsequent evenings are part of the National LGBT Plus History Month programme. More details will be posted in the chat um, um, as we go throughout. As, uh, as um, uh, Fidelma has just posted um, the, the link to Philip's book, 
Albert and the Whale. Um, and so we'll be posting uh, links throughout and um, there's the, the link to It's a Sin. Um, so um, at the end of the talk, there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers. So if, if anyone in, who's uh, in the audience has any questions throughout, please do post questions in the uh, Q&A function, which you can find in the bottom of the, um, the Zoom window. And we'll be answering those in the last half an hour or so um, of the talk. Um, so uh, please do note that the, this evening's talk is being recorded and will be available soon after um, on the John Hansler Gallery and our uh, SoundCloud um, account. And so um, to, to start the, this evening's talk off, I just wanted to give a bit of context as to why we opened up the, this evening with um, It's a Sin by the Pet Shop Boys. Um, so It's a Sin was a, a, a music video that was directed by Derek Jarman in 1987. Um, and as, as an avid Pet Shop Boy fan, um, uh, in the, in the, particularly in the 1980s, I, I, I grew up uh, dancing to um, It's a Sin and Rent, um, and the, uh, both videos of which were directed by Derek Jarman. And it brings us to the present moment because we're all longing to be in nightclubs and dancing um, together. Um, but also, um, It's a Sin is the title of Russell T. Davis's um, amazing uh, series that's currently showing on, on Channel 4. Um, the reason that we brought um, Philip and Sarah together as part of LGBT History Month um, uh, this week is because John Hansler Gallery and Philip have been in long discussions about curating together a, an exhibition uh, reflecting on uh, Derek Jarman's incredible activism, artistic practice and, and gardening. And I, I was going to uh, bring on a prop here. So I have the beautiful uh, publication, uh, which is Derek Jarman Protest, which is the result of the exhibition that we were um, working in partnership that was initiated by Emma in Dublin back in 2019 and is um, now scheduled to open in Manchester uh, later this year. And ourselves, um, John Hansel Gallery and Philip are curating the exhibition Queer Nature that should open at John Hansel Gallery in November. And so I, I kind of uh, introduced how I first came across uh, Derek Jarman as an artist, a filmmaker, writer, an activist. Um, and I wondered, um, Philip, Sarah, would you be able to share with us how you first met uh, Derek Jarman or, or came to know his work? Sarah. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, um, oh, well, it's always wonderful to think about Derek Jarman and uh, how we first encountered him. Um, I thought uh, in my fading memory that the first time I'd come across Derek Jarman was um, when I first went to university and I was feeling very homesick. And I, uh, I was kind of the first weeks of college, I, was, I went to Cambridge and I thought Cambridge was just like the weirdest, snobbiest place I'd ever been to. And I thought, why am I here? What am I doing? And I, my little straggle of friends that I'd managed to make in the first few weeks, I dragged them along to see Sid and Nancy at the um, art cinema in Cambridge, a wonderful cinema. And um, anyway, I thought Sid and Nancy would be a bit of a challenge, but Sid and Nancy was distributed with three Derek Jarman shorts that he'd made for the Smiths. Um, I suppose it was really before the age of pop promo, but they were films that went with the songs. And none of us knew it. So the lights went down, um, the, <laughs> the curtains went back and on came these three incredible short films and I was just like oh my god I never want to see any other kind of cinema now this is it this is the kind of cinema I want to see and um and then we watched Sid and Nancy and I was like well you know it's a great film apologies to Alex Scott it's great but all the time I was just like well who is this filmmaker uh and then that sort of following summer I took a play to the Edinburgh Fringe and I um with my now a few more friends luckily <laughs> I took my cast to go and see the, what I remember it may not have been was the premiere of um Last of England at the Edinburgh Film Festival and and I took my friends, I was like, oh, this is really great filmmaking, you're going to love it. And we sat and I, for people who haven't seen Last of England yet, this is an incredible film, but it's a very, it's sort of madly apocalyptic vision of the world. And it's, it's very um, powerful. It's incredibly powerful. And I uh, was so me going, oh, it'd be like jolly pop promos. I looked along the row of all these newfound friends and they were all sitting in a pool to horror as the lights came up at the end. And I was like, oh, wow. It, I mean, it was really articulated the existential fear that we all felt with um, Thatcher. And um, it was just such a terrifying vision. And then onto the stage, the lights came up, bounded Derek Jarman and Tilda Swinton and the rest of the cast. And these warm, jolly people came onto the stage and you couldn't, you couldn't put it together. You were like, but this hell, you're 
that's envisioned and then these wonderful people who had put this project together and I suppose it was a real lesson to learn that you know the kindest most open people of course are the people who can understand the true atrocity of what um, conservative politics can do so in my memory for a long time that was how I first encountered Derek Jarman uh, through film and then meeting or seeing him in person but actually I sort of remembered a funnier story when I was last talking to Philip was that when I first left home and I worked in London I was working in a bookshop in central London I thought oh I'm really you know out on the town I'm really in the middle of things and a man st obviously started to like me in the bookshop where I was working and I thought oh uh, but how am I going to explain to him that I've got a girlfriend it's quite hard in 1984 or five, I can't remember what it was, it's quite hard to actually say you again. Coming out was such a complicated, difficult thing. So I was like, how am I going to say? How, what can I do? So I didn't think, being a bit cowardly, I thought, well, I'll go to the cinema with him and I'll take him to something that will sort of show that, <laughs> that maybe things are a bit more complicated than he might be imagining. So I looked down the list of city limits, <laughs> looked through, and I saw Carabaggio was opening. So I said, oh, here's a film, this this will do, <laughs> I'll go and see this. So we went to see Carabaggio and of course nothing had prepared me for actually what a complex, brilliant film Carabaggio is about relationships and sexuality and love and, the, and repression and the violence of love and the violence of repression. And so it was possibly the perfect film to choose, not that I knew so I think what I'd repressed for a long time was that I'd actually used Derek Jarman as a sort of vehicle, a sort of, I don't know what it was, a sort of complicated seduction, anti-seduction tool. But um, but yes, my first vision of Derek Jarman was really after that screening of Last of England. And from there on, I mean, he's such a, uh, to watch his films was mind blowing. And then to see him as a person, he's such a, was, is, is such a wonderful, generous force in the world. And um, it was a real revelation of, of how you could occupy a cultural space, how you could be a maker and not only make something that was brilliant, but be someone in the world who could represent so much, not just about um, who he was in the world, but also the vision that he had. So that's me, sorry, long, long uh, story, <laughs> but that's my answer. <laughs> and Philip, did you first encounter Derek German through his films as well? Yeah, I guess. Well, I went to, um, uh, from Southampton to college in London in 1976 which is a really interesting time to be in, in London. And um, Seb Sebastian had been made then, so but that was the only, only big film he'd made, you know. Was, uh, um, and a friend of mine who was a drama student called Peter Paul Hartnett, um, uh, uh, he and I were both into like what was happening in 1976, which was punk. Um, uh, and um, and uh, I was going to the Roxy Club, which is where sort of the punk bands were playing, like the Damned and the Jam and Vibrators and things. I didn't realise that the lead, the, one of the uh, lead singers of the Vibrators was married to Marianne Faithful at the time, which is a really interesting link with Derek because he made a wonderful film for um, uh, 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 Broken English, wasn't it, Sarah? Yeah. Um, and um, so anyway, but um, Peter Paul Hartnett one day, I was doing the fanzine um, and um, Peter Paul Hartnett was, uh, brought this script along to show me and he said, um, you know, you should write about this and actually would you like to be an extra in it? They're casting for extras. And I, so I read this script and I thought, oh my God, this is so pretentious. And uh, also being a really hardcore politicized punk as well. I thought it was really whatever. And it was, it was German's Jubilee. Um, so I, 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 I missed out on being in Jubilee, but, um, but, but, but sort of hanging around with those sort of people, it, it, it sort of punk, because it was such a small scene, you know, Derek was quite a powerful um, presence on the punk scene, and especially in the way that it segued from, from the kind of high art sort of like in the It's a Sin video, you see um, Dougie Fields is, is in that, isn't he, Sarah? And uh, he was one of those people um, sort of, uh, who are sort of the bridge between sort of glam and Bowie and Roxy and what was going into punk, the kind of art school end of punk, you know, which of course uh, Sex Pistols were art school, you know. And, um, product mostly um and uh, so jarman was a kind of presence in that and and it was very interesting and initially i, I really you know and i still actually find jarman's work more interesting actually when it i like it when he he he, he, he um he doesn't do the big things in a way sometimes i feel as though they're 
sometimes compromised by his having to work with other people in a way I don't, you know, that's not necessarily true. But then, uh, but then I became friendly with, um, with Neil Tennant. And um, so I was there when all that started up and, um, you know, the commissioning of the It's a Sin and things like that. Uh, so I was a new, a new Neil then. Um, uh, and, uh, and then, and then uh, Derek working on the um, it's, a, it's a Sin tour. Um, which is the first Pet Shop Boys tour, which is incredibly lavish. And, and Derek directed like one of his films. He made the films, the, the Super 8 films, which were shown on back projections, but he also designed all the costumes, which are, you know, something out of um, uh, a Zeffirelli film in a way, mixed with sort of Kenneth Anger, mixed with punk, mixed with lots of things. And so, um, so yeah, and that, that's really how I, I, I was drawn into to German as a, as a force, uh, as Sarah says, I mean, he was, you know, he was an incredible force at that point. It was late seventies, early eighties, right through to the nineties. Yeah. And at that point in in nineteen eighty seven is when he he received his diagnosis. So so I guess that that would have had a huge impact on the community and the the, the filming of It's a Sin, particularly. Um, and Sarah, when when we were talking about this, the the what we were going to talk about, you mentioned the, the incredible coincidence. Was it during the filming of It's a Sin um, at the studios? Was it Full Metal Jacket that was at the same oh, time as It's no, a no, Sin? No. Uh, <laughs> it's because of my love of Stanley Kubrick and Derek Jarman. <laughs> I'm always looking for links. And um, no, it's uh, the Smith films, actually, the films he made for the Smiths. They were filmed. Okay the Smiths videos sort of back to back with um, Stanley Kubrick filming Full Metal Jacket in, it's in Beckton Gasworks. So um, Kubrick took over Beck the Beckton Gasworks which was then being demolished and used the great tanks that had been used for holding gas to bury explosives so they could make this kind of explosive atmosphere for um, Full Metal Jacket. So that was happening. So I think, it, I mean, I don't know how nerdy we have to be, but we, if we went and looked at the video, I think you could see the walls. And I think when they're graffitiing on the walls in the Smiths videos, that, that's actually sort of back to back with the Kubrick shoot. I quite like that because I mean one of the things that's sort of a theme throughout Jerry Jarman's career is that he's forever being upstaged really um, financially by people like Peter Greenaway and these big production films so it's like the um, the idea that they're sort of on one side of the film handheld Super 8 cameras <laughs> making the, the the videos and then there's all the um, Baroque uh, production that went into Full Metal Jacket but somehow I feel like Kubrick and um, Jarman on some level have a lot in common because of that amazing amount of work that they put into the thinking and the pre-production of their film work. So they both, I mean, from different kind of um, psychologies, but at the same time, they've got this amazing sense that they load as much in as possible so the image is totally erratic. You know, every object in the film has been thought and made. And when you look at Jarman's sketchbooks now, which I think are, um, all, you can see them, there's a publication that has them all, you see how much layered work, the sketchbooks, the preparation is as beautiful almost as, film work that results and the same with Kubrick the th thought that goes into the making the detail that even on set you're looking at objects that have got have been made specifically to represent something that no one on watching the film on screen can touch so they um there's a lot in common they're real artists of the cinema but with very different scales of budget so I um I don't know it's, it's kind of un, not really allowed in this country to be an artist and work in cinema but somehow both of them managed to do it so I um, I always feel for them but yes that's an amazing cultural moment a crossover between the two <laughs> and, uh, and, that's and, such an in sorry Woodrow, no, no, Philip you gone no I was just saying it's just really interesting talking about the artist film and people like um, Nick Rogue uh, uh, um, uh, where they were I mean as Kubrick I'm sure Kubrick said but but it's interesting where the society and the cultural aspects uh, and the, the the art of making films start to blur that, you know, so when Rurg is casting Bowie in The Man of Fatal Earth or Mick Jagger in performance, and that's really, that's, I see that, you see that in Derek's work, don't you? And uh, and also that sense of, um, um, I always think of Derek's work be, being somehow of the 1940s, it's not, and that's why there's that apocalyptic thing is that there's that kind of that's the kind of residu residual background that he's working from that he comes from and 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 that goes kind of, through so it's really interesting when he's filming you know next to uh, on the Beckton works and the which is you know the 70s London was apocalyptic yeah. I mean Covent yeah. Garden when I used to go to the Roxy Club that was the only club in in Covent Garden there were no 
clothes shops there at all. It was an you know abandoned food market. I used to carry a knife. Um, <laughs> it's really stupid, um, but there was a lot of attacks on punks. <laughs> no, but it's the um, Common Garden of Hitchcock's frenzy. You know, it's the murderous sort of edge of uh, criminal London. It's the it was dangerous, and also Soho. I mean, Soho was a totally off limits territory. I mean, I can remember my mother. You must never <laughs> walk down Dean Street and uh, be dragged off by the white slave trade. Was <laughs> always her message to me. But um, Soho was totally off limits, and we really was pretty furtive and nasty, and um, right in the heart of London. So the idea that it's sort of a, a gay friendly safe place now is kind of extraordinary you think you would never have gone in you know <laughs> gone into the dangerous territory i don't know it's very strange but i think you're right about um jarman with the 40s behind him um you know i think powell and pressburger are much closer you know relationship to jarman's work and um and also it's funny because like, during lockdown in our household we've been watching prison escape films to cheer ourselves up <laughs> and we've been uh, it's kind of uh, beautiful to watch people being so ingenious to get break out of prison clean eastwards you know <laughs> everything happening out of alcatraz and it was been but there's something about it about the, all the digging the holes and then when i was reading um jarman's diaries again for this uh, reading about his awful time at a sort of awful public school boarding school low grade boarding school you know and actually at one point digging his trying to dig a tunnel out the only way it was like cold it was like that sort of uh, sense that you had all the time you've got to dig your way out of this awful sort of conservatism that landed on britain after the second world war when everything was sort of reimposed to make some kind of normality happen i just really hope with our current prime minister and all his churchillian um, language that when there ever is an escape from covid that we don't have a similar sort of conservatism land right back on us but something tells me that's probably on the cards. <laughs> but I feel that that um, Jarman's all about clawing his way out of that and getting back into the world again. Uh, I won't keep talking, but I was just thinking as well, another person who he links with is Warhol, because you think he's bringing it's the sort of art world that moves into cinema uh, and cinema takes from the art world. So Nick Rogan was sort of taking from music, taking from the art world. I feel like Jarman sort of crept in. <laughs> you know, he made the, those beautiful sets for the devils, understood what Ken Russell was doing, pushed and sort of made art come into cinema in a way that, um, well, I mean, some of it, like Greenaway and Sally Potter and people did at the same time, but it's he's really the person I think who succeeded the best in that. And creating that coterie of players as well. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, like John Waters has the same, you know. That, that's the essential support mechanism is it? because I suppose like as a director you are very vulnerable if you're a director aren't you I mean I, I don't I, I'm not a director but you you can see that you know there's a lot of pressure on you but there's a lot of giving you have to give so to be surrounded by a group of people who are like-minded who almost you know like defenders almost mm -hmm. um, um, and so and that's what that's because the, the, the whole thing I think about Derek's work and Roy and Power, Power, Power Bresberg is that they have you know, the key components are set, aren't they? Um, the key aesthetic components, uh, the key mechanical me components, because they, you know, it's make, they often make, I watched A Matter of Life and Death the last week and it's such a radical film, yeah. such a radical film. And every still is like a neo-romantic painting. And, and, and the color, the color saturation and the, and the segue into black and white and stuff. It's so, and it's so, camp in a wonderful British way, you know, sort of very, you know, stiff upper lip camp, which is kind of a contradiction in terms, you know. Um, There's actually yeah. a funny little moment in the um, Derek Jump in Modern Nature when they talk about they've met a lady who's seen uh, two men falling out of the sky into some pits that are behind where um, Dungeness and she could never quite understand it. And then whoever he's, I think he's talking to Neil Bartlett and Neil Bartlett goes well that's the beginning of Matter of Light and Life and Death they were filming it there so they saw the, <laughs> the falling out oh, of the no. they said, I, so it's absolutely sort of twin um, cross wow. I but I, yeah, no, I think that's right and also with Paul and Pressburger you think Pressburger was German heritage so after the war to bring that sense of balance and that sense of otherness into the, all those narratives is extraordinary. It's, so I think that is totally a play as well in German you see that community of actors and it's not uh, what you would expect a cast of uh, camaraderie to meet on screen. It's something much more than that. Yeah, I know. And A Matter of Life and Death should still be available on the BBC iPlayer, I think. And, and it's extraordinary that transition between uh, Technicolor and black and white as well. It's, it's, it's a stunning, stunning film. Yeah. I was wanting to take us back to the kind of post-apocalyptic um, London that you were talking about and just thinking about um, Dungeness and Prospect Cottage and af after um, uh, Derek's diagnosis and the purchase of Prospect Cottage and how Dungeness itself is 
quite post-apocalyptic, but also there's a lot of care in, in what he did um, uh, in Dungeness. So I w was wondering about that trans translation of uh, Apocalypse to Dungeness. Mm. Well, I suppose it's interesting you know, because he's got the time. I went to his flat in, in, in Phoenix House in, in, in Charing Cross Road, which is opposite Foyle's books. Um, it's above the theatre, above the Phoenix Theatre, and it has those crittle windows, but it's, it's a red brick, so it looks like a council block, you know, but it's slightly upgraded from. But it's tiny. I mean, it's just tiny, tiny, tiny. And the one bedroom, and they had this huge bed by, made by Andy, the furniture maker, who was the boyfriend of Peter Paul Hartner, who's the person I was talking about earlier. And this bed just filled the whole room. And he used to have, I had a meeting, I commissioned Kareth Wynne Evans to make a, a film for the record label I was running. And uh, so we had like the production meetings, <laughs> you, couldn't, you, know, you couldn't move in the place. You know, so. But so the notion of like being sort of trapped in that, not trapped because that was Derek. So, but it, he, he had, obviously it's clear he had to have a, like a get out, you know, and especially when with his diagnosis, I can't remember, when was Prospect came in? When did, when did that happen? What was that date? Do you remember anyone? Uh, so, I can't think when it is. It's after he's had, I think he's been diagnosed. And he then, has, hasn't he? Yeah. I think his father died, so he inherited money so he could move. Um, he had the money to buy it. And there's a, there's a sort of a moving story about he and Tilda Swinton are driving and they see it. And she's, and he says, oh, that'd be wonderful to buy. And she goes, well, why don't you? And <laughs> she writes the cottage. But it is, I, and when you read the diaries, you realise what pressure he's under. Not only because he, he talks about the sort of um, pressure he's got of becoming more famous and more visible and all the pressure of the film world. And it's all just on his doorstep, really, in Charing Cross Road. You're right there in Filmland. Mm -hmm. But it's that, um, I'm sure that when you... Uh, read the diaries again you see that pressure that already creeping that sort of hostile the hostile environment of um what was coming from central government and the kind of attack on aids as a as a punishment for homosexuality and all that sort of stupid rhetoric that came at the time you realize what a horrible pressure it was and so to have a thinking space was, must have been incredible I, um it reminds me a bit of um because i'm thinking about wittgenstein and wittgenstein had his heart in the wilds and i always think that uh, derek jarman did the same it was like you move away just have a space where you can just be clear again and think. It's like, it's like, it's like Thoreau, you know, isn't it? In, in, the, in, the, in the woods. Uh, there's a classic um, queer nature thing going on there. Edward Carpenter, um, yeah. Walt Whitman, they do this sort of thing. And it's, um, it's almost like taking on, so, you know, you're going to call me an outlaw. Well, I'm going to be an outlaw and I'm going to occupy. Uh, Dungeness is just, I mean, it's officially a desert, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's really a strange, strange place. And it is like, it is like that kind of, the, 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 the edge lands of London, um, where sort of Derek was making those films, you know, and also where he was living, you know, the sort of, um, you know, the, he, he, his uh, uh, Butler's Wharf and those places, the deliquescent, you know, rotting edges of London, which are now, so much pumped up with capitalist, <laughs> whatever you know, that's the uh, 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 Canary Wharf and whatever. But um, so that that contrast is extraordinary. Yeah, we uh, have a, a note from Irene in the chat who who has um, uh, confirmed that Derek brought Prospect Cottage in 1986. So thank you for confirming that. Fantastic. Um, Irene is Google. <laughs> <laughs> Irene's better than Google. <laughs> um, uh, as if by magic as well, we could at this point segue into the trailer of uh, Derek's film, The Garden, if that's helpful, which is um, his 1991 film, um, which is an in incredible insight into his, his uh, personal world and his, his, per his own universe and is, is filmed in and around Dungeness and Prospect Cottage. So um, I think uh, Nadia or Sylvia was going to um, uh, play that if we can. Thank you, Nadia. That's that's brilliant. Um, apologies again for our, our audio quality. Um, uh, we'll what we'll do is we'll, we'll share links to the files, um, so um, uh, to the, the the video files on YouTube, so anyone who wants to can follow up and and watch those again. Um, but that's quite an extraordinary film, The Garden. I I, I wondered um, if either Sarah or Philip, you you had any reflections on on. Your, your encounters with Dungeness or with the film itself, The Garden? 
I know more about the film than Dungeonette, <laughs> but I, um, oh, it's such a great film. It's ch changed my life, really, The Garden. It's such a fantastic film, and it's a shame. In fact, it's on, I think, uh, the BFI player at the moment, so you can watch it online if you want to watch the whole film, and they've restor um, digitally restored it, so it's a very beautiful copy, even though it's horrible watching it online. But I think... Um, Oh, I'm, I'm taken with so many things that we've been saying. Uh, uh, the interesting thing to me about Apocalypse and the garden and making a garden in that situation is that we're now going towards the sort of climate apocalypse that we know is going to happen, even though we're all in denial. And there's something about Jarman taking his understanding of all his history of understanding plants and loving plants and loving gardens. You know, he spent a lot of his childhood in Italy and in the Mediterranean and understood that um, how you, uh, gardens are different all around the world that you plant for the conditions that you live in. And I think in 1980s, our gardening was very different. <laughs> we didn't have um, Beth Chateau telling us that we could build drought gardens for drought. We had to make it up ourselves and try and stick in geraniums that died inevitably or <laughs> whatever, it, what fuchsia bushes. And so I think with, garden, um, with the garden that Jarman made, he's pushing back against all those sort of British suburban notions of what a garden could be and going, um, or not sort of admitting that he's part of nature, that then making that garden that, uh, and finding ways to grow things in that environment. And even though there's a struggle, there's a, a terrible moment in the diaries when I think he's brought a iris that he saved from Dockland. He'd seen this sort of stranded iris in the middle of rubble in Dockland and he'd saved it and preserved it and taken it and loved it and nurtured it in Dungeness. And then there's an awful morning when he walks out and the salty air has completely destroyed the iris and he's just got one flower left, you know, and it's a sort of tragedy of that struggle. And anybody who's a gardener knows you sort of go through um, great labours to try and make things survive. But it, he's really arguing with a sort of sense, again, I think it's a post-war thing, that post-war we'll put in our fuchsia bush, we'll put in our rose bush, we'll dig for victory and make ourselves this square patch of England. He's sort of opening that all up. He had Dungeness because it didn't have any fences. He says the only um, sort of division he could see was the horizon, that's all it, uh, it had. And then sort of opening things up and making something that's really working against the grain as hard as it could. And I think it's also that he's working with the, uh, using the landscape as a, almost understanding that the landscape is a performance, that the, the nuclear power station, Dungeness itself, those old falling down um, fishermen's cottages, the ecosystem of the beach, everything is all as one. It's, it's already performing something about what Britain is. And as he, you know, the voiceover says in the trailer, it's a journey, we don't know where we're going, it's a failed project. But at the same time, that's what we've got and that's what we need to live by. So when you come to the film of the um, the garden, I mean, I, I know he was ill during the filming, so other people had to be his eye a lot of the time. You know, so Chris Hughes's wonderful cinematography. I mean, in a way, he's having to stand in for um, Derek Jarman a lot and record, but he's recording already a vision that Jarman has enabled by framing the garden, framing the landscape with what he's put into his garden. I I, I just, uh, I'm, very, I'm very compelled by the artful artlessness of it. You know, I was moved by that table that's outside um, Prospect Cottage as this great act of welcome. There's a table outside and it seems to have been there for centuries. But when you read his diaries, of course, he's found the sleepers and made a table and it, but, and yet made it to be part, made, read the landscape and reinterpreted and put something in the landscape that's sympathetic. And so I find this, um, it's a really extraordinary vision for all our wonderful heritage we have in this country of anarchic gardens you know we have Charleston and we have Sissinghurst and we have all these fantastic sort of pushback gardens where you know that sexual revolutions took place and at the same time there are these amazing revolutions in what gardens can mean and pushbacks against nature. German's garden's really special because it's a it's a sort of clever reading it's a serious reading of what's happening and then a remaking it sort of feels against all the odds so I, I uh, both the film and the garden are sort of inseparable to me now I, I can't think of them apart and then and it becomes more meaningful as we come closer to making having to make more decisions I think about climate and what we're going to do in the future because that beach feels very fragile and um, good for him to have highlighted that really by, by living there I don't know if Philip no, has been to Prospect Cottage more than well, me that well, I think that's really, and because actually in modern nature, in the in the in the in the diaries, um, he, he really makes clear he knows that's what's happening with the climate, you know, and so he's there when the great storm happens, the big storm of 1987, um, mm -hmm. and he jokes about the hut is going to be lifted up like Dorothy's house in the Wizard of Oz, you know, he'll be <laughs> transplanted. You know, it's a very, again, very Powell Pressburgery sort of image. <laughs> Um, and the fact of him removing himself from society to see it better, you mm -hmm. know, that's a classic, it's a monastic thing, you know, but in many ways Dirt Dirt was a monk. It's very interesting to go to Prospect Cottage and see how much the religious, religious iconography is not, it's not just ironic. Mm -hmm. It's not just ironic. Mm -hmm.
Um, so uh, as I, I, that's, I found that really interesting. So just to quickly relate that um, uh, Woodrow, Ros Carter and myself went to Prospect Cottage two years ago now, mm. which seems weird, but this is, um, this is even further ago because of lockdown and everything, um, to, um, to recce for the, um, the exhibition we're, we're, we're putting on later on the year. Um, and so it happened that um, uh, Amanda Wilkinson, who had the keys to the cottage, couldn't get to us to, to let us in to see the cottage. So we had to get the, co uh, the key from a neighbor, which is really weird. And, um, and the thing about um, uh, Prospect I think is it's not, it's not a, you imagine it to be like Thoreau's Walden and it's not, you know, it's like a suburb. It's like neighbors, it's like the close in neighbors. Yeah. Uh, you know, like you just imagine all these houses have got all these little stories going on, you know, these weird places and weird people who might be in them. And there's all sorts of uh, images of, of that. And um, but the upshot of it was um, actually, yes, Nadia, do you want to run to photographs now? Um, was the so we had a lock in. In Prospect Cottage, <laughs> we had the keys. Uh, we thought, wow, you know, it was extraordinary. And I suppose the most amazing thing about uh, we've just some photographs from that day here, which Nadia is going to run from us. So just Nadia, just move along as you see fit. And we said, uh, um, and it was an old fisherman's cottage, one of those tarred wooden cottage cottages, which um, was expanded. Oh, we've lost the pictures now. Um, which was, gradually... was, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say, was each cottage originally a, a train carriage? Was that the not it... not those? Oh, was it? I don't think those were. No, there were ones which were railway carriage. That's the classic sort of sort of squatters' cottage, isn't it? So they're getting an old train carriage. I don't think that was. I think it was originally a fisherman's cottage because it's all sort of tongue and groove built inside, isn't it? I don't think it was. I think from what I remember in the diaries. Do you remember, Sarah? I don't. I think right. it's. I think it, uh, it is literally a fisherman's cottage built on the beach. I think the train carriages, because um, they're on rivers as well in this country, I think they must have been brought around on boat, presumably for workers yeah, living. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, you've got inside, sorry. I'm... Yeah, so we got inside, which is remarkable. And it's really like going into the TARDIS because there are actually eight rooms there. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it's still full of those things. You know, this was only two years ago, uh, um, a year after Keith, Derek's partner, who sadly died, um very abruptly um and he was the sort of caretaker the gardener there uh, and that's partly why it feels so uh, much of a living place you know because keith carried on living there and he was part of derek's world and Derek was part of his world and keith was a fisherman as well as being a bus driver and uh, various other things wonderful person um so the, it, it, it's not a museum that's how it was when derek was there um but they are all these little theatrical set pieces, you know, and everything was, it's very difficult to not take a photograph of everything because everything looks so wonderful. And it's um, mm. a really, um, this huge big knoll sofa in there and the old uh, telephone and then Derek's landscape paintings, which were made there. Um, you know, Derek, uh, Woodrow, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Because you were very, I know we were very affected by that. Well, I, I had been um, making pilgrimages, I guess, to Dungeness for, for many years with uh, friends and partners and, and had, had seen the outside of the cottage and the landscape uh, for a long time. And then through, through working on the par project in partnership with, with Emma, um, Manchester City Art Gallery and Amanda Wilkinson Gallery, we, we were able to get in. And it was, it was quite, quite extraordinary because it really was as if um, uh, Derek had just stepped out potentially, um, and, and um, it was a, uh, a stunning, crisp November day, and we were able to. It was the end of the day, and we were able to to, to watch the sun setting behind the, the nuclear power stations. As as Derek writes that he watched the sunset every day, that he would never miss a sunset, and and so that that incredible privilege of being able to watch the sunset from um, the room where where. Where he kind of overlooked the shingle and and the power stations. Um. So I think Nigel's is going to start the photographs again. I think just to go move through. Yeah. 
hopefully. That's great to have got trapped inside. I like that. Well, you know, <laughs> got us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the 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 the, the, the glass pane, a uh, diamond etched with. I don't know where that text was from. I don't know whether it must have been a quote. I don't know where from. The the lettering on the outside is John Donne, isn't it? Mm. Um, um, and there is, you know, there is, you know, there's always the joke about Derek being the kind of both saint and magician and sort of a black magician, if you will, or whatever. And I mean, he was very interested in magic, wasn't he? And and um, there's a lot, a lot of the texts in, in the library in, in Prospect College are medieval texts, not original, but, but you know, um, uh, 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 a very arcane uh, library. Um, and uh, so, but it's just the, uh, I think the sense of it being a living space. Is, I remember when we came back, where do they eat their lunch? <laughs> there's, no, there's no table for lunch and there's no dining room or whatever, you know, and it sort of thinks, oh, you know, is this, you know, um, but there was a really you know, a nice kitchen and things. So it's, uh, it's odd when someone like Derek is sort of domesticated in a way, you're given this domestic, uh, aspect of it and uh but yet yeah, one which is you know everything you could frame any particular part of the the house and it would make a, a really great image yeah it's, it's hard to think of him ever to be being domesticated i mean um in the, all the senses of the word yeah this is it what's important yeah. and there's <laughs> a, a beautiful shot in the garden of um jarman's hands placing a Sort of necklace, I suppose he's made of pebbles. So there's pebbles with the holes on that are, um, that are found on Dungeness Beach, and he sort of lays it onto the um, one of the upstanding mm. spikes. And I always think that he he reminds me a bit of Maya Deren, the people who ritualise mm. any artwork. So whenever you're making an artwork, it's not about mechanisation. If you're making a film, it's about um, something much more magic happening than that. It's sort of he's such a um, uh, he's so exciting, really, that he takes everything out of that context and makes it about some, an organic process that's much longer and older and more. Found than just some simple recording or simple living really it's about an, um, it's artifice as much as it's about living beautiful you can, you can see by the the totems and the the the, the, the necklaces of stones that are, fill the house that the outside is very much inside and the the lavender flowers that are drying and the santalina flowers that are drying um, and the, the the tables and surfaces that are like altars within the within the space yeah. that's beautiful and the, the stones, the stones are hag, known as hag stones. I'm sure most people know this, but you know they they protect against witches. They have a, a charm like quality. And in fact, fishermen would loot them in in strings like that, or put them on the prow of their boat to um, forestall against drowning. The the busts we just saw there were busts that Keith said that uh, Derek would buy from like local junk shops, knock the heads off, <laughs> and then either put a holy stone on the top or that. He wound wire around that one just now and um, really made me think I was watching the new Derek, uh, uh, a new Francis Bacon documentary, which is a lie to the new biography of which has come out, very good biography of him, and how that evoked Bacon again, that 40s thing, you know, the kind of the moving head, almost like a, a PTSD thing, you know. Um, um, that's so interesting that you that I can't feel, I mean I can see the anguish like we could see in the Petra Boys video anguish but you can't read it in the same way that you could in a Francis Bacon painting you know that's what it's about whereas yeah. Jarman does something else he was refusing it all the time and refusing shame but admitting that the pressure's yes. on yes 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 no that's true that is true I was just seeing the power station and there's a very funny bit in the diaries when they think that the power station's exploded when the it get, uh, the power lines get hit by lightning. And Derek Jarman's like, phone, we've got to phone people and they're phoning all these people. And then um, Keith steps in and he's like, I'll just find out what's happened. <laughs> and it's yeah. like the power station's powered down because of um, because of the lightning. But it's sort of this terrifying moment when you, but it must have been terrifying to listen and hear that all the time. Because yeah. it, it never isn't windy there. It's so yeah. exposed. I know, dangerous. <laughs> it's terrific and um it also it makes me think of other it makes me think of britain and then you know Aldborough and um not pretty places Aldborough isn't a pretty place really it's become prettier but it wasn't it, it's, it's still a bleak place isn't it it's uh 
I didn't, I never liked swimming at all, bro. I just found it really scary. I don't know why, you know, but. Um, it is scary. It shelves away so quickly. It's yeah. Those- yeah. My mum always used to say, because she used to go on holiday at, at Aldborough as a young woman, and she said the great thrill on holiday was to walk along the beach as far as Benjamin Britten would go with his young friends, swimming naked, jumping through the phosphorescence in the sea, <laughs> niggering young women <laughs> watching over the things. But I think they look very, very beautiful. So it, talk about queer nature, you think what yeah. uh, queer experience adds yeah. to the English countryside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it I also, thought, like, sorry, sorry, go on. No, no, I was... Making jokes. Uh, no, because also I was thinking about, um, you know, a, a German film of War Requiem, War Requiem, which is so astonishing. And that link with um, Wilfred Owen as well, who's another sort of watery figure. You know, he was very much, Owen was wedded to the sea uh, uh, as well. And that the, the, um, the, 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 the ambivalence of the sea, um, the, the kind of escape that the sea offers, Yes. You know, Oscar Wilde was a great what he was the only wild swimmer in my book <laughs> but uh, um but yes yeah, so that that sense and, but the funny thing is that a dungeon nest the sea is very far away isn't it it's there but it's far away it's yeah. very odd again you didn't ominous, swim right? you didn't swim when we were there in November a couple of years ago have you ever swum in, in dungeon nest no Keith advised me not to um no, I always thought that was because the nuclear nuclear, <laughs> <laughs> nuclear power, but I, I think it's much more about the uh, currents, t- t- um, uh, 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 riptides there and stuff. But um, if, if you look on um, Google Earth over Dungeness, there's an extraordinary um, almost spiral jetty at the end of the uh, the uh, kind of point. Um, so so yes, the current does look very severe. Yeah. <laughs> And it's just so, well, the reason why I didn't actually even try that day we were there was because it was, the tide was right. I mean, it, you couldn't even see the sea. It was just like so far away. It was just this line on the distance. And that notion of Derek having that view from his desk, you know, in that room yeah. uh, felt very, and it, 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 it really did feel as though he was still there, didn't it? I, I, I went into that room on my own and apologized to him for the intrusion. You know, it's, <laughs> Because it, it was just at that point, but um, when the fundraising campaign was still underway for for the cottage to be purchased, which we found out back in April last year that it had been su- successfully fundraised for, and so Creative Folkestone uh, going to look after the cottage itself and the contents of the cottage or the archive went to um, the Tate. So, so there was a, it was an amazing window that we had in in the into the cottage while it was still furnished and while the library was still in place and things like that. Yeah, yeah, very much. Sarah, you talked about um, uh, the importance of artists' houses and, and the experience of artists' houses and, and kind of drawing a line between Prospect Cottage and the possibility of artists doing residencies there in the future and, and places like Kettle's Yard. Um, well, I, I, uh, well, I think that's a, it's an interesting, um, story really, and especially in uh, well, no, is it just English? I was thinking about all the houses. I was thinking about Charleston and Kettle's Yard and um, Little Sparta in Hamilton Finley's house and um, Prospect Cottage. As these, I mean, it's, I suppose we now all think about live workspace because it's a saleable thing. We think, oh, that's what we, you know, what an attractive option that would be. But really, we're talking about artists who could, had to use their houses as their studios and so made an artwork of where they lived and. Um, the fact that that coincided with sort of great experiments in alternative living seems only a plus <laughs> in my eyes. And it's, so it's exciting to me. I mean, I, th- I, I see a close link between um, Prospect Cottage and Kettle's Yard. I mean, Kettle's Yard wasn't owned by artists, but were uh, curators really, or people who collected art, but were very involved in the art world and had a proper exchange with artists and were very alive to art making in their lifetime. And so were very, they made a house of art in, in a sense, but they were all, um, Jim and Helen Ede as a couple then invited Cambridge, the people of Cambridge into the house so you could go and visit the house you could go and knock on the door and have a cup of tea at a certain time of day while they lived there and then since they left the um, house to the city it's become a, a site you can go to you can sit in there you can read the books you can be among the artworks so it's a different idea of um, curation and exhibition I suppose the idea that you inhabit art that it's something about the body and about community and experience that I think you get the sense of with um, Prospect Cottage as well I know Jarman had it as a home but he never put up a fence he I, I'm sure he was quite well aware that there would be bus party uh, bus groups of people coming to look over the, uh, over the garden I think it's a uh, about 
being visible as much and being participatory with art and we have so much you know in the economics of things art's supposed to be so rarefied and difficult to see whereas you think that actually artists are making spaces all the time I'm thinking of the most obvious ones so I'm sorry about that but you know that the making of art is such a profound thing and to, for it to live uh, in homes and in houses that can be sustained afterwards however difficult that is to preserve is wonderful I was thinking as well as about Cocteau, Cocteau there's that house in the south of France I can't remember uh I can't remember the name, he went to stay one summer and they said, oh, you know, you might want to paint things. And he painted it, he had beautiful drawings inside every cupboard, every drawer, you ever, it's got a beautiful cocktail. And it's that sort of sense of uh, intervention into the, the usual world and to making of something different and retreat and making a retreat that shows who you are at the same time, which is something extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I get that sense the same at Charleston that Duncan Grant really, but you know, even with the garden sort of taking on the wildness that he understood from Gertrude Jekyll and making something wild and then the house becoming this sort of feral space of um, paintwork. And then I always think of Vanessa Bell's garden with he's made for her a garden that you step out of her, um, her bedroom straight into the garden. So the two things become synonymous. It's the same thing about having, making a prospect. Mm -hmm. But with Jarman, you feel like his garden and the house open up to the prospect. They understand the landscape in a way everyone else was kind of imposing on it. So I think that's his triumph is that he's made something um, entirely enlivening for the place that he lives as much as um, for himself. Do you think uh, that opens the door uh, towards the queer nature and a queer approach to ecology? Um, yes, I, uh, well, I have a whole thesis. I, I, um, I don't know where to start with this, but when um, a couple of years ago, I made uh, it was part of an exhibition that was about um, the vision and landscape and, uh, and the English landscape called Murmuration. And I made a film with Helen MacDonald that was about uh, the sort of history of the British Secret Service that had its feet in ornithology, because a lot of the people who set up the British Secret Service had originally been bird watchers and animal and watchers. And um, we thought this was very interesting. We had lots of bird watching footage, made this exhibition, and it was reviewed on front row. And the, um, the literary critic, John Carey, was very upset by the film. He was like, no, get away from my beautiful vision of English countryside, this hor of a horrible, nasty, malign idea. You've got the rule being spied on. It's not. It's bird watching. It's beautiful and innocent. And it, I mean, I'm sorry for him, but at the same time, you think how many people are excluded from the countryside? How, how much is the countryside the preserve of the conservative version of any nation? And the idea that if you, you know, have got brown skin in a predominantly white country and you walk into a village, how many people are going to glare at you? And if you're a buoyantly gay man, then how are people going to respond to you? So the idea is sort of the the shift, the ecology, if you like, of Dungeness, where Jarman now is an out gay man in the 80s and a time of pushback against um, freedom, could inhabit that space, live among that community. And we know uh, from his diaries how um, what a jolly space he made with his neighbours as well. Uh, how his uh, overtness and his, the, the shape of the world that he created plays into the, with well, creates and responds to the ecology of the place, it becomes part of the place. The nuclear power station is just a backdrop to what he's making and what he's commenting on. So it's a, uh, just as much as the Pebble Beach, you know, it's extraordinary really. So I, um, no, I'm, I, I think it's an extraordinary tribute to that, to noticing that uh, for much of the time, there's a lot of shame attached to who can walk through safely through the English countryside. And it's a pushback against all that sort of petty nostalgia that we like to reinvent all the time about hedgerows and thrushes and stuff as we kill them with our pesticides. So I'm, I, I don't know, I, I, I love what he managed to achieve there and the shifting of our sort of cultural ecology as much as our um, natural ecology. Um, now, yeah, I won't keep going on, <laughs> but it's right. I feel like it's a real mission for us now to think what, what spaces can be occupied. You know, we think about decolonizing museums, but you think, well, what about decolonizing the landscape? It's so, so strange. Okay. There's the incredible photographs that Howard Suley took of Derek Jarman on, on, on day release from hospital with his kind of identity name tag still on his wrist while he is weeding and, and planting plants. Yeah. Um, Philip, what, what, how would you relate to that kind of idea of the body in landscape and uh, kind yeah. of uh, opening the landscape? Again, really a neo-romantic um, idea, isn't it? All those paintings by Ayrton and Craxton, uh, Cecil Collins, Graham Sutherland, um, where the body, the countryside morphs into body and the body morphs into countryside, you know, and that draws on a lot of kind of sometimes dubious stuff of kind of... Um, rural um, uh, magic which is 
does veer into, and Helen McDonald writes about this actually in, in H's for Hawk, how that it does veer into sometimes quite extreme right wing territory, um, like the whole Pitt Rivers thing. I don't know if you know about that story. It's really interesting, the Dorset thing that, that um, this creating of um, uh, an, an, an Englishness which is, you know, linked into the Neolithic and to sort of semi-druidical or whatever, but does tip into overt fascism, really. Um, um, which is why Derek's film Journey to Avebury is so interesting because that kind of almost gets into that territory, but of course Derek would never, not that he's creating something truly uh, sort of transcendent and about the landscape. Um, where a journey yet to Avebury, which is this bathed in the glow of, of, a, of a setting sun, seemingly, you know, a sort of ancient sunlight. Um, and uh, it is, is um, really draws down that sense of the, 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 the implicit power of the countryside as a healing place or as a place of, you know, as a place of queerness where, you know, nature is is queer you know is uh i was only sp speaking to someone today about about um uh gender shifting in in in, in sea animals that you know there are certain organisms which will only decide their gender once they arrive at some particular point in their their lives and they'll make a decision about what they want to be and then that might change again um Huh. You know, nature doesn't, you know, nature is, it is literally fluid yes. and, you know, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a shifting thing, you know, I think that's, I love Journey to Avery, it's fantastic, they, they showed it in the, um, the Dark Monarch show, which Derek, uh, uh, Derek's other work was in, um, in the, uh, about 15 years ago at Tate St. Ives and uh, Nottingham Contemporary. Um, which was, I think, was a really interesting take on on Derek's interest, also in magic as well. You know, um, artists like Sven Berlin and some of these kind of you know, some of very dodgy characters, you know, in in their political <laughs> things. But interesting what they're doing about yeah. about the land. I think Journey to Avery is such a beautiful film and you're exactly right. It plays on all of that sense of, oh, um, here we are on a lovely sunny day, the end of a summer day. So it plays on all of that. But then there's something that it's almost like nature's looking at you through it. It's really uncanny film. It's like for all that you think you can enter into it, it's looking right back at you. So there's something that he will never permit that we're people aren't part of nature. It's like, you're all part and what are you looking at? <laughs> what do you not know? Like you were saying about sea creatures, the idea that we're so sophisticated as humans because we understand sexuality or gender or we so, you know, we've got consciousness you think oh we understand nothing <laughs> almost all animals have the same pushes and same drives of libidinal drives it's insane to think that isn't true and that those things aren't occurring in nature but it's just the story that we've been told but, but that's why yeah that's uh, the space that uh, he creates in Journey to Avery is brilliant because it's all about ambiguity and unsettling and not knowing and the thrill of not knowing and the thrill of ambiguity which I think oh. is, is one of his his very first films the Journey to Avery as well and and it I think for anyone who's not seen it, um, who, who's, who's uh, watching, it is available online with an incredible soundtrack by Coil as well, which which kind of um, makes it more estranged um, as well from the landscape. Um, if anyone has any questions, please do pop them in, in the Q&A box. We have a couple of questions which have come in. Um, we, we might um, talk a bit more about um, the, the Queer Nature exhibition we have coming up later, but um, there's a question asking Sarah if you could expand a bit, uh, expand a bit, sorry, about what you mean about decolonizing the landscape. <laughs> oh, there I was throwing that out there. But, um, it's just that I think that we, uh, as we look at all our cultural myths, so yes, there's one thing to look at the history, the supposed history, which is supposed to be fact of, you know, our great generals and things and whether they should be in statues and all the things that we're addressing at the moment, what objects should be in museums, how they're curated, how they're narrated. I think we also have to think about the way that our, um, our mythology spreads out into the countryside and to the landscape, how we've adopted all of that. And what Journey to Avery, with going to the Avery um, site represents is that there's a history that's 
beyond our modern consciousness it's beyond what we find useful at the moment it may not be in the future but at the moment we believe that we're beyond paganism we're beyond magic i don't know that we are and uh it's that sense of what we're excluding from our history what we're not looking at what we're not addressing and like philip was saying those um histories the histories back into our ancestral past some of them can be taken for very optimistic reasons and some of them contain very nationalistic reasons they can be used as a sort of basis for stories as they were in pre-war Germany to suggest that the German soil was originated in the myths and fairy tales of strength and <laughs> blood and soil that became the you know why the Nazis like the Wagnerian opera I'm not saying that's happening in Britain I hope it's not happening in Britain but at the same time there's a touching all the time on this sort of um nostalgia for a kind of landscape where people adopt what they like about landscape but ignoring other things so there's um <laughs> this well-known uh, writer of uh, walks in this country, I won't name his name, but I, uh, he's, for instance, will walk out and make a walk and it's as though he's the only person in the universe when he writes his experience who ever saw that journey. And I think that's incredibly colonizing. I think that's a style that we've got used to recently in nature writing and it's really difficult. And there are wonderful nature writers like Philip and Helen MacDonald and Olivia Lang who problematize all those situations, who say that landscape and the way we view it or the way we frame it is much more complex and if you come to a filmmaker like Derek Jarman or a, uh, a writer like Virginia Woolf who understands the whole history, the whole history right down to dinosaurs in Virginia Woolf's case, all the, the sort of stratified layers that go into the making of the land, not only the little surface that we live on in the mediated world at the moment or the history we're taught from the, you know, when the agricultural revolution happened, which maybe makes it more relevant. If you go right back, you understand something of the way that the narratives have been presented to us now. And so it's not, I suppose it's, yeah, it's addressing how those things have been adopted and colonized to create a sort of cultural myth or a nationalistic myth. Um, I don't know. I think, I, I think it's, it's something we could start a, a whole series of talks about. I think it's a, it's a, a beginning of a very long conversation. It's a very uh, important <laughs> conversation. Um, I was gonna follow up with a question uh, from uh, Larry. Um, who'd be very interested in any thoughts Philip might have on Derek Jarman's highly distinctive merging of history, uh, for example, Marlowe, Shakespeare, um, and contemporary political and aesthetic radicalism. Are there any precedents for this? Yeah, Shakespeare. <laughs> it's exactly what Shakespeare does. It's exactly what Shakespeare does. Shakespeare, I mean, The Tempest, I always think is a Derek Jarman film made by Shakespeare. I mean, it's, but also the way he treats history and myth. And I mean, he's dealing, the thing is like Shakespeare's, I mean, it's interesting to compare them because, you know, it's difficult. It was difficult thinking tonight about tonight's event about as a, as a, as, as a celebrating a sort of history mm. is that there you, the three of us are here trying to account for our, our admiration or our, enthusiasm for Derek Jarman um, and it's really really filtered by our, bi our biographical experience mm -hmm. um, and our what our identities and the fluidity of our identities and the changing that and so it's really difficult to just discuss these things and you can't separate these things they are all so much part of one and they blow into one um, that's the more I read Shakespeare now, the more I see that. And I mean, he's a very queer writer and he's a and there's so much the fluidity in, in his writing. I mean, there's a lot of political shenanigans and stuff, but at base you, you see this person who was, you know, there's this theory that Shakespeare actually spent a time, time at sea before he started writing as a playwright, that he might've been a sailor. There's, you know, there are, uh, uh, People have been through this, the work. See how many times "ocean sea" is me, me, mentioned as a, or used as a, as a, as a, as, a, as an allegory or whatever. Um, and it's really fascinating to me that, you know, I think Jarman's Tempest was the only Shakespeare thing he did. But of course, he did the sonnets, didn't he? Um, so yeah, I think Shakespeare is your is the answer to you, really, in a way. That that is that is definitely the precedent for for and because of Derek's happiness in being in the sort of 16th, 17th century, he's kind of happy there, isn't he, in a way? 
Yes, that's his yeah. spot of nostalgia. Queen Elizabeth I is where he goes, totally. looking aside all the bad things that Queen Elizabeth I did. Yeah, quite. The cultural renaissance that came under Elizabeth yeah. I. I think yeah. that's right. He's a, yeah. Yeah. We all have our myths. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, really good question. Um, Curious about Shakespeare. Um, probably everybody knows this by now, but when lockdown first happened, that um, Shakespeare wrote King Lear, and when the plague in plague year, uh, so when he was in lockdown, that's when he wrote King Lear. So uh, I throw that out to everyone in the audience. So if you can produce a work of art as good as King Lear <laughs> this time, then you, as long with your sourdough bread, then you've done very yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And for me, it's interesting because Shakespeare had this. His probable lover was the Earl of Southampton, who lived in Titchfield. Um, here, which of course was a harbour at that point. Uh, the water came right up to Titchfield, which is quite close by to here, Sarah, you know, the geography. But, um, um, and I love this notion that um, The Tempest was inspired by the uh, 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 disastrous attempt, well, uh, trying to reach the James Jamestown colony um, uh, mm -hmm. by ship, the Sea Venture, which, which wrecked off, the, off Bermuda. And it was the um, the shearies, the, the shearwaters, the, the seabirds there, which gave rise to the, the island of strange noises. No, that's an account written. This and that's what Shakespeare drew on. Yes. Uh, and there's a chap called Stephen Hopkins who was on, who was wrecked on that shore. Uh, he was from Southampton, uh, and he 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 actually came back. He 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 made it back. They, they, they did they did generally survive the thing. Made back. And then he went back out on a on a ship called the Mayflower. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and ended up being one of the he, he had he and his partner, female partner, had a child during the voyage, whom they called Oceanus, which is such a Derek sort of thing. Um, <laughs> That's and, it. Uh, when it's when you said and he went back out, can you imagine being shipwrecked, managing know, exactly. and then exactly. think, oh, I'll do that again. Exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then so, I bring I mean, a wife. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, with these mad religious fundamentalists as okay. well, basically, right. <laughs> you know, telling you what they're going to do, I and mean, it's like crazy. Um, For a moment, I thought you were going to say they were trying to reach the Isle of Wight, and I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> <I know. laughs> like but, really... but then, only, only, only ten years later, uh, I read this in Peter Ackroyd's um, "Queer City, Queer London" book that um, a boat was uh, stopped and turned back from the New England colonies because three. Of the of the uh, inhabitants, although I think maybe it's just the three were uh, turned back. Were, uh, obviously queer, they were um, sodomites. And they were turned back. They didn't. They didn't want sodomites in New England. No, we don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> that's really uh, oh. that's very daring. <laughs> that's insane. Yeah. That, that takes us on to uh, uh, fittingly onto another question, which is: uh, Have you from James? Which is: Have you any thoughts? On the relationship between the AIDS crisis and climate crisis in terms of the Conservative government's inaction and a link with climate justice and queer experience? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, all, don't, I feel for any of us who just were on the edges of the AIDS crisis even that it is so extraordinary now that the if the world has a mind to it it can create a vaccine for covid which cross fingers will help us in the in the current state of what's happening and yet it took so long for people to find it even to recognize what um hiv and aids was about before even finding um some kind of treatment that worked and now the um cocktail treatment that does work you just feel like Oh, if they could scapegoat us now <laughs> and think of reasons, well, I'm sure they are um, secretly, but uh, think of reasons that they could let us go, they would. It's insane that we work so slowly in some directions and uh, in the direction of healing it takes so long. I don't know. I hope that, uh, because don't you, I don't know. It's funny to talk to a screen, but all of you out there don't, it must change after this. We've spent so much time being alone. You felt like we've been able to stay still, look at nature, feel the seasons turn around with all its grimness and its excitement as time passes. And surely we've all noticed that the world feels a calmer place without the human activity that we've been um, layering onto it in recent times. I, I just feel like there will be a, a wish in the future to go forward and do something. In a way, perhaps we've become jaded and think recycling a plastic bottle is enough. It just feels like things have to change. I mean, I, I, I imagine, I don't know, because it's funny to think to go back into the world and I imagine somehow that I'll open the door and when I next go on the train to central London, it will look like it did in the 1970s with rubble everywhere and just 
boarded up shop fronts and graffiti. Yes. It will look like that. And Berlin will look like it did when the wall yes. came down. And yes. all that moss that's been over it. And But hopefully as well, some feral trees will have grown yeah, in yeah, it. Yeah. Um, you know, I just feel like there should be a pushback now towards climate change and uh, towards changing things. Mm. I, I noticed just in our little neighbourhood, because everyone's doing these tiny walks, um, kids have started to they find little scrap. I mean, we were really overbuilt where I live and more and more building is happening. But they find little scraps of land and there are these little secret gardens that have been planted. And I think that generation who are now seven and have had no education because they've been out of school for so long, at least they know about the earth and they know what that means. And I feel the future it looks more promising. I just hope that we don't rush back to some kind of weird version of normality in this aftermath. But that's my hope. Didn't we all love listening to birdsong without cars? Isn't that, <laughs> isn't that going to cause enough revolution in people? Um, I don't know what Philip thinks. Will you swim in the murky sea? Has it got clearer since... Uh, you, uh, uh, got it got quieter. Um, it's got quieter for the animals and it got quieter for the whales because there's been less shipping. So they've been singing oh. more freely and more vocally. Um, <laughs> so that's definitely happening. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I totally, I completely, I was watching the rise and fall of Reggie Perrin last night. Yes. Because it was 1976 <laughs> and I've been thinking about 1976. And because um, that was such a crux point for me, it was when I went to London, it was, I started the year 1976, well, in May 1976, I saw David Bowie on the Station to Station tour, which was a very transformative thing. And he was, you know, he comes out, he came out singing as Prospero, he is Prospero, you know, throwing darts in lovers' eyes. And, uh, 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 and a very, you know, uh, I'm really interested in the idea that he was going to make a film with Jarman, this Neutron, where he was going to, and also Jarman wanted him to play Ariel or compose music, for, uh, songs for Ariel in The Tempest, which obviously didn't happen. Um, but yeah, and then I ended that year, uh, you know, when in, in London, punk, uh, punk clubs and sort of just, it was a, so, um, but I see that the, the uh, looking at those sitcoms uh, from the 1970s, how empty the streets are and how, how so different it is, you know, that it's much, more, you know, it's actually, you can see, the natural world hasn't yet been beaten out of yeah. out of human existence. Yeah. You know, there, there are still front gardens. Yeah. Front gardens are a wonderful thing. I mean, that's a very, you know, Derek thing, these nice little capsules of your ex personal expression, you know. Yeah. I used to love those, I mean, you know, you know that I'm sure you know those shell gardens. You see them, you used to see them in in Bournemouth where people oh, I love the shell gardens. <laughs> incredible, aren't they? And I mean, that's just the I mean, I suppose it's it's like it's like outsider art, but it's it's um yeah, it's just that sort of notion that you make these little spaces for yourself, you know, very proudly, and uh, and they all they usually derive from the natural world what you're doing with them, you know. Um, the uh, front garden's a seduction because you think as you walk past it, if it's the scent and things of the front garden are the seduction, I always think it's such a shame when people pave them over and put their car in it. Yeah. You're like. Well, what's that about? <laughs> no, it's just that sense. It's funny at the moment that because the uh, air's a bit clearer because we're still in lockdown here, the, it, just the sense of scent and the season turning yeah. is so uh, alive to us. It's exciting. Yeah. So I don't know. I feel like, yes, all those things that are about pleasure. And I mean, they're in Derek Jarman's diaries, the way he talks about colour and flowers and plants and the history of plants and gardens and different gardens he's loved and books he's loved about gardening. All of that love is, is all about pleasure. And I feel like we've lost pleasure somehow and at least this slow time has given us the chance to start thinking again about the, the simple it's not even simple things but the things that give us pleasure the, the nurturing can give us as much pleasure in fact i believe there's even if you dig in the soil it releases a a, a, whole, a not a hormone a, a scent anyway that is um uh, gives us a sense of euphoria so more digging if you're feeling miserable <laughs> <laughs> we we're coming to the end of our um, allocated time. Right? Thank, thank you, everyone who, who's, who's, who's submitted questions. We might not be able to answer all of them. I think we might be able to answer one more, which is uh, from Anna, um, who was asking if uh, any of the panelists had any recollections or experiences, encounters with the film Blue or the concerts that preceded it. Didn't see them. I saw Blue at the cinema. I, I don't know if I saw it at the premiere. I remember, oh, I, it, was, I, it was too sad, really. I mean, it's such a brilliant film, but just the best film for me. Uh, with all those films, Last of England, 
uh, the garden and blue as a trilogy I just feel like are the, one of the things that we should really treasure in this country and blue was such a beautiful project because you really felt that sense of collectivity that um, Philip was talking about already the group of German allies working together pushing to make blue happen I mean I know that was happening you know James Mackay was really pushing to make the garden happen when after um, German had had his diagnosis and really pulled it off this beautiful film but with blue you felt where somebody was really very fragile to make that come together and that genius to know take image just color like i was saying pleasure there's pleasure in color there's a blindness in just a single color and then let voice let thought give space i mean it was just the most brilliant thing i love it it's such an audacious film I, um uh oh it blew me away i think i i remember as being so blown away but, but so moved by it because it was terrible to know what was happening to somebody that i think that an audience all cared about all wanted to be well and it was obvious that it was he was going through such an atrocious experience and at the same time there was this beauty and there was this vision and I um so that's my memory of it I'm trying I think I for some reason I feel like I saw it on the south bank on a very big screen but I don't know if that's I don't know my memory is so weird but it was just that vision how terrible to be someone who's about vision who keeps coming and going from blindness and how brilliant to think how to translate that into cinema still it really is extraordinary so oh yeah, I, I I love those three films. I think they're genius. I love the Super Eight films because I love that they were so close to how someone sees, and for that, that to end up with Blue, where it's about not seeing and seeing everything with your from inside you, is such an extraordinary achievement. That I, um, yeah, I think it's a great film. I don't know when Philip, did you see it at the cinema? Uh, well, um, I must have done, but I don't have anything to add to what what, what you said really. Just yeah. looking at Woodrow Phoenix's, the, the, just the one other question then, mm. Woodrow, your namesake, and, uh, asking about if Dungeness was uh, such an unusual theatrical landscape. You know, D Derek had, German had a head start on making his garden. I think that's a really interesting observation because there is a performative site, isn't it? And the beach is a performative place. Mm. You know, because it's, it's a place of transition. It's a place where, you know, you, you are enabled to do things which you're not allowed to do in any other place like it always strikes me that if you're on one side of the road in Brighton if you're wearing a bikini would be outrageous <laughs> you just start over the other side and it's fine <laughs> and it's like it's extraordinary isn't it um so yeah I think that sense of of the performative um nature of 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 the apron of the beach you know the stage apron of the beach is yeah and the other thing that, you know, the back Derek is he's such a performer and he is such a performer. Every, you know, it, like in person, he was very performative and nothing was ever low key, was it? It was just like, whoa, it all sort of, you know, and it was like, you must do this and we must do that. And <laughs> it's incredible, you know, it's not, you know, not allowing not allowing yourself to be beaten down, I suppose, really, you know, because then a, a, a lesser person could have just caved in mm. to all that terrible. Um, the thing about the, um, as well is that we forget that German grew up at a lot or spent a lot of time in Italy as a child and Italian gardens are very different to British gardens and they're a lot about making pleasure places but being very theatrical so he talks about um, his memory of going through the Borghese gardens and riding a donkey and <laughs> and he remembers a clock that was made out of a fountain or something you know all the sort of playful things a bit like the shell gardens that we all love as children so I think he always took with him that sense of theatre and obviously he worked on things like the devils as a theatre or a set designer so I think he understood totally that 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 was already a theatre set and the whole country is there to set and we're all making it up as we go along and yeah. he would make his framing of it with the house so I, I um yeah it's exactly what Philip's saying it's that frame that makes it appropriate or makes it inappropriate <laughs> you know, one, one, <laughs> one of the which strikes me there is I watched um Adam Lowe's film on Lucchino Visconti the other day and I thought what if Derek Jarman had had Visconti's money I mean it just you know because I mean obviously Visconti Oh. very wealthy for Italian family you know and that on the scale that he made those films I think Derek would have it could have diluted and things but it's quite interesting they kind of dealing with similar sorts of similar things not not really but they're coming you know from the same uh, it's just another auteur I suppose in a way but um the um German's the Pasolini, he has not has to. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, yes, that's true. class works on all its levels. Yeah, that's true, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's true, exactly. So I'm, I'm sure and hopefully this conversation will continue in and around um, our exhibition coming up in November later this year, Derek Jarman uh, Queer Nature, that's 
curated with uh, Philip. Um, so th thank you everyone who's uh, stayed with us through this uh, panel discussion. Thank you particularly to Sarah Wood and Philip who are um, amazing guest speakers. It's been wonderful to have an insight into Derek Jarman's world. Thank you to Valentina Cardo. Um, a special thanks to uh, Sylvia, um, Nadia and Fidelma from the John Hansard Gallery team for facilitating, for facilitating us and looking after us this evening. Um, in terms of this evening's event, thank you to Winchester School of Art for uh, working with us in partnership on this event. And it is part of the uh, National LGBT Plus History Month program. Um, and the links to that are in the chat. Um, we, uh, through the gallery and in partnership with, John, uh, with uh, Winchester School of Art, have another uh, few events coming up in the following evening. So tomorrow evening, uh, from 8 till 10 p.m. we're hosting uh, or co-hosting uh, Drag Through Time uh, with the stage door um, in support of uh, Southampton Pride, uh, which will be streamed live through the stage door and uh, Southampton Pride's Facebook pages and features uh, Vilma Celli, Aura J, Bella Black, Dawn and Tink. Um, and also on, on this coming Saturday, uh, we're lucky enough to uh, uh, host uh, Valentina again, who will be in conversation with the artist uh, Oozing Gloop and Olympia Bakakis. Um, and uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it already, Oozing Gloop's video, Comiocracy Now, is, is currently available through the John Hansar Gallery. So Oozing and Olympia will be uh, discussing uh, their work um, so uh, that's tomorrow evening from 8.30 p.m. Uh, through the John Hassler Gallery Eventbrites. Um, uh, please do join our mailing list to keep updated with future program and free exhibitions. Um, Sarah's uh, film, uh, Here Is Elsewhere, is still currently streaming through Kettle Jard. Um, Philip's uh, wonderful new book, Albert and the Whale, is very shortly available um, and uh, we will be uh, sharing links to, to those items. Um, so thank you everyone um, for uh, staying with us. Thank you, Sarah, thank you, Philip. And to close this evening, we are going to share um, the um, Derek Jarman's uh, film uh, for Patti Smith's um, video uh, memorial song, which was directed by Derek Jarman in memory of uh, Patti Smith's friend, Robert Maplethorpe. Uh, so we thought that was a, a fitting tribute uh, to Derek also to end tonight's conversation. So thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Philip. And thank you everyone for watching. Um, <laughs> take care. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.